Good morning. I'm Commander Dennis Spence. I'm the Chair of Research, Education, and Facilitation at the Naval Medical Center, San Diego, California. In this podcast, I'm going to be talking about research methods. I have two objectives for this podcast. First, we will talk about how to develop a research procedure appropriate for your aims, hypothesis, and or your research questions. And then we're going to describe a succinct and detailed method to conduct your research study. This is a nice slide that depicts the research process. As you can see from the top of the slide, the first thing you have to develop is a research question and a problem area that you're intending to solve with that research question. So initially you select, analyze, and create a research statement. And then you do your literature search. As we talked about in previous podcasts, This is an integrative process where you're going back and forth, revising your problem statement, your specific aims, your hypotheses as you get into the literature. And then you narrow down and formulate your research objectives or specific aims and hypotheses. And then you have to tell the reader or the reviewer how you're going to conduct that research study. And that's the research methodology. Some questions that you need to ask at this point is what additional data do you need to meet your research objectives and how you're going to collect that information and that's what the research methods section is for. In the research methods section things that you have to consider include the type of variables, how you're going to operationalize those, your type of study design, is this a qualitative or quantitative study, is it a survey type study, what data collection techniques will you be using, how will you sample uh, from your population. Are you going to be doing a convenient sample, stratified sampling? You need to describe in detail how you plan on collecting your data as well as analyzing it. You also need to discuss any ethical considerations and any sort of pre-testing or pilot study uh, considerations. This is a good slide that helps you think about the research methods section when you're writing it up in a research protocol. When you're developing the research methods section, it's a lot like putting together a puzzle. There are different parts to the puzzle that you need to put together to make the whole. For example, you need to have a research design. Is this a quantitative, qualitative? Is it a survey type design? You need to describe your research procedures, you know, specific details of how you're going to conduct the study, how you're going to collect the data, how you're going to operationalize or measure your variables, how you're going to analyze the data, as well as any human subjects and ethical considerations and data protection concerns. So you must present a whole picture that is comprised of the parts. The critical part of the methods section is that you present a whole picture of what you're planning to do. You must remember that sometimes grant reviewers and IRB members may not have expertise in your area that you're studying. However, they are looking to see that all pieces of the puzzle are put together so they can see a picture of what your research method or your plan to conduct the research study is and how you propose to answer your research questions. The research methods section describes in detail how you will plan to access the subjects, how you will plan to recruit and select them, how and when you will consent them, how you will carry out the study, analyze the data, manage and store the data, and protect participants. And for granting agencies, they may want to know how you plan to disseminate your results, as well as any limitations in your study design. One of the first things you need to think about is who your population is and how you will sample that population. You also need to think about where you will conduct the study. Is it in your clinic? Is it in the operating room? Is it in the field? Do you need to get permission from the gatekeepers? For example, when I did a study at the sub-school in Groton, Connecticut a number of years ago, I had to get permission from the commanding officer of the school to recruit his sailors. This can be a major feasibility issue. If you don't have access to the potential population or medical records, 
then this can be a real showstopper for you. This step is critical from both a human subject standpoint, but if you cover all the steps, it will make, you, make it a, a lot easier when you implement the study if you think through these questions of who you're going to recruit, where you're going to recruit it, how you're going to recruit them, and do you have permission to recruit and access that data or those patients. On or to whom is the intervention being performed? Who's going to provide the data for the study? We already touched on this a little bit, but you need to think about your participants. Or if it's a retrospective review, what patient population and databases will you be accessing? If it's an animal study, what animals are you using? If you're studying humans, do you have access to the population? How many potential subjects can you recruit? For example, if you're wanting to study the effects of acupuncture on insomnia symptoms in patients with post-traumatic stress disorder, you need to think about how many patients are seeking out acupuncture who may be interested in your study. This can be a factor that can determine how long it may take you to complete your study. You need to think about what are your inclusion and exclusion criteria. This is critical if you're conducting a clinical trial in which you want to make sure your groups are similar and that confounding variables do not influence your outcomes. You also need to think about how you will sample the population. When you have sampled them, if it's a clinical trial, will they be randomized or matched on key characteristics? Will you stratify them by certain procedure? For example, maybe you're interested in evaluating postoperative pain after a inguinal hernia repair, or you're interested in the incidence of chronic growing pain after inguinal hernia repair. Or there's several ways to do an inguinal hernia repair. It can be an open procedure or it can be laparoscopic. If you're intending to randomize patients to a placebo and a treatment group, you may be, need to stratify your patients into groups based on whether it's an open or a laparoscopic procedure. Now we're going to briefly go over some sampling issues. Here's a few definitions that I think can help you. A population can be defined as including all people or items with the characteristic one wishes to understand. Because there is very rarely enough time or money to gather information from everyone or everything in a population, the goal becomes finding a representative sample or a subset of that population of interest. A sample is a subset of that population that is selected to represent the entire population. These are the who of the study. The key thing to remember when sampling is that the sample is ideally representative of the population that you're interested in. The problem is, with a lot of clinical research is that many times we use what's called convenient sampling, meaning we enroll those patients that are coming through our clinic door or in our operating room holding area, and they may not be necessarily representative of the general population that you're interested in. You need to make sure when you're writing up your proposal that you clarify that. And certainly when you write up your manuscript, you need to clarify how your sample was related to population and are there any limitations in terms of generalizability of your results. A key factor to remember is that the sample is not just patients, but can also be nurses, retirees, sometimes it can be considered cities, ambulance companies, inpatient units, clinics, hospitals, you can be at the individual or group level. You can even be an animals, certain type of events, and so on. The key thing to think about when sampling is that you want to have a manageable size that allows you to answer your research question. It needs to be practical in terms of cost, availability, and accessibility. You also need to be able to collect and analyze the data from the sample and make ideally make inferences to the population of interest. Ideally, we want to make sure the sample is representative of the population at whole. Sampling is the process of selecting the sample from the population of interest, and there's different types of sampling strategies. Probability sampling means that each unit of a population has a known chance of being selected. Examples of this include simple, stratified, or cluster. Simple sampling is each unit of the population has an equal chance of being selected. Whereas with stratified sampling, each unit of a population are or organized into strata and then randomly sampled. 
Cluster sampling is, involves successive random sampling of units from a larger to smaller groupings. Non-probability sampling means that the subjects are not randomly selected necessarily from the population. This type of sampling is most common in clinical research, and the most common way you can think of this is the convenience sampling. Other types of sampling include quota, snowball, purposive. Snowball sampling can be where you enroll a patient and then you ask them if they know other potential uh, participants who would be interested in the study and then they keep going on and so on and so on. When you're describing the sample, you need to describe the characteristics of the sample that represents the population you're interested in. For example, it may be all patients presenting for elective shoulder arthroscopy. It could be all women who have been deployed less than one year after childbirth. All patients who survived a 60% uh, total body surface area burns. Or even patients who suffered a traumatic amputation of both arms. So when you're writing up your method section, you need to clarify what is the population. And sometimes when you describe you use statements like these when you're describing your sample it makes it easy for the reader and the reviewer to understand who your sample is and who the potential population you may be trying to infer your results to. Once you've identified a population and a sampling technique, you need to decide on what criteria you will use to enroll your patients. The inclusion and exclusion criteria help you form the desired sample. It specifies what the sample will look like, what are the characteristics of the subjects have in common, and what characteristics might make them ineligible. And it can also impact the internal and external validity of the study results. If the inclusion criteria are very rigid, then the results may be only applied to a very specific population. However, if the exclusion criteria are too loose, then you might introduce some bias into your study results. Here's an example of some inclusion and exclusion criteria from a study we have ongoing here at Naval Medical Center San Diego. In this study, we are interested in seeing if a 30 milliliter normal saline bolus injected through the an epidural catheter after vaginal delivery hastens the return of motor function. Based on some previous research, we found that some results that suggested that it did in, indeed work. However, when we analyzed our results, we found that we had some group differences which, in, which biased our results. So in this study, our inclusion criteria was that patients were over the age of 18, they could read and understand the consent, had a functioning epidural in place, a planned expected vaginal delivery, consent for epidural anesthesia, and they were American Society of Anesthesiology class 1 and 2, meaning these were healthy patients. We wanted to enroll patients who had a functioning epidural because it, if it was not working, then how would we know our saline bolus really worked? We excluded patients who underwent a cesarean section because we were not interested in this population. As I mentioned, we excluded any high-risk pregnancies. We did exclude patients with a history of psychiatric or neurological disorder. We also excluded patients with musculoskeletal disorder. And any patients who had an actual suspected dural puncture, this is where you get a hole in the, uh, when you're placing the epidural and it can get what's called a spinal headache. The reason we excluded some of these conditions is that they could potentially bias our results and skew the data. We also excluded patients who received narcotics in the spinal space or had what's called a combined spinal epidural because that was not the uh, population or the procedure that we we're interested in. The last exclusion criteria was the most important in the, because in our previous study we found that patients in the saline bolus group had actually received um, significantly more top-up epidural boluses with solutions other than our standard solution we use for epidurals. And when we submitted this manuscript for publication, one of the reviewers pointed this out and uh, considered it a major weakness of the study. So when we designed this follow-on study, we just chose to exclude any patient who received a top-up epidural bolus 
with a solution other than the standard solution that we normally use for epidurals. We felt that this would help control for that bias that we found in our previous study. However, what it did do, or what it's currently doing, is it actually is slowing our enrollment in this study because we made the inclusion-exclusion criteria much more rigid, and so many patients who may be potentially eligible may not be able to participate in the study. Also an important thing to consider is that you get buy-in from personnel who may be actually taking care of patients or subjects. For example, we needed let other anesthesia providers, our trainees know about this study, as well as the nurses, and to let them know that, hey, we may potentially enroll this patient, we're going to ask them to participate in the study, could you adhere to this inclusion-exclusion criteria in our protocol, if possible? Certainly, you don't want to limit a provider's ability to provide care to a patient, but sometimes if you can get buy-in from them and there's no potential harm, conflicts, then you may be able to uh, proceed with your study and enroll your patients. So a key point is that you need to get buy-in from personnel who may be taking care of your patients so that they can actually help you complete your study. If you're thinking about enrolling vulnerable populations, there are additional safeguards you need to adhere to and things you need to address in your written protocol. And I would refer you to the appropriate guidelines uh, for institutional review boards, or if you do the CITI training, they have excellent uh, resources and information on this. In this slide, I list several potential vulnerable populations that there are special considerations and things you need to think about. Children, women of childbearing age or pregnant women, fetuses and neonates. In some circumstances, if you're doing a, a study on a pregnant woman, you may need to get permission or informed consent from the father of the baby as well as the mother. Some racial minorities may be considered a vulnerable population, certainly prisoners, and in the military we cannot conduct research on prisoners. Persons with handicaps or mental disabilities, and you can read further on. An important aspect in military recruitment is military population, specifically junior enlisted personnel. When you're writing up your protocol, you need to be very clear on how and when you will recruit vulnerable populations. You should refer to the 45 CFR 46, as well as the 21 CFR 56, and the Belmont Report for more specific guidelines on ethical principles and guidelines that can assist you in recruiting and conducting research. Now we're going to talk about what to think about when you're describing what you're going to do in your research study. The most important point is to describe what your study plan or your procedures are. If it is an intervention study and you're going to administer a drug or a placebo, you need to describe what you're giving, how often, how you're randomizing the patients, and very, you need to be very specific and provide enough details so the reviewers understand what you're doing and they can identify the potential safety concerns. For example, if you're doing an ultrasound exam, you're going to do a study where you're going to randomize women to have an ultrasound scan of their back prior to placement of an epidural, then you need to describe in detail how you're going to conduct that ultrasound scan, what any potential safety considerations. This is important because not only for reviewers from the Institutional Review Board or grant reviewers, but many times your uh, associate investigators or research assistants are going to be following your protocol and they're going to use that as almost a standard operating procedure of how to conduct the study and make sure that they do it the same way every time. If you have uh, investigators or research assistants or who are doing procedures differently every time they enroll a subject, this can introduce bias into your results. As I mentioned, and I can't stress this enough, you need to provide enough detail so the reviewers know what you're planning to do. And you need to remember that they may not be in your specialty area. You also need to describe the instruments you're using and how often they will be administered. You will need to present the reliability and validity data on the instruments you're using. 
This is important because what you you need to make sure the instrument is measuring what you're you're intending it to measure and that it consistently measures that outcome of interest. Likewise, if you're using a device or a lab test, you should describe the accuracy and permit precision of the device or piece of equipment. You need to provide copies of the instruments or questionnaires in your research protocol and in your grant, and you need to provide information whether or not you receive permission to use that instrument from the publisher or the author of that instrument. And many of the instruments that are, if they're in the public domain, you do not necessarily have to get permission. Um, but it's best to investigate and see who originally did it. And as a courtesy, email the um, author of that questionnaire or instrument and ask them permission to use it. In some circumstances, you may actually need to purchase or request permission from a company who owns the copyright on a particular instrument. And at the end of this podcast, I provide you with some references and resources where you can find and locate some various um, instruments for clinical healthcare research. An operational definition can be considered as the instrument or device that will be used to represent a variable or a concept. And these can be considered your questionnaires. And really, they're nothing more than a proxy measurement for your variable of interest. For example, maybe you're interested in acute pain and the op you're going to operationalize that as the incidence of severe postoperative pain and you may define that as a pain score greater than a 7 out of 10 and you may be using a visual analog scale or a verbal numeric rating scale there are different types of measurement methods that you can that can range from paper and pencil to observation, video or audio, interview, projective, and even biophysical such as uh, saliva samples, blood samples, blood pressure, and so on. When you're thinking about measurement, one of the things you can think about is that there's eight degrees of separation between what you would call a substance theory and an actual score on an instrument. And this reverse triangle gives you a good uh, representation of what goes into what you would think about in terms of classic measurement theory. You know, where you start out with an initial theory uh, of a particular construct or variable, and then there's a whole uh, measurement theory that helps development of an instrument or a questionnaire. And the operational definition is how you intend to operationalize and measure that variable of interest then you can get it down to the unit of measure. Is this in, uh, for example, if you're measuring pain and you're using a visual analog scale, are you um, actually measuring in millimeters on a 0 to 100 scale and that pain score is the um, measurement, say 50 millimeters? And then how your unit of ana analysis and you come up with the score. The important thing to think about is that you need to make sure that your instruments are reliable and valid when ideally when doing a clinical research study. This is especially important when you're applying for a grant because reviewers will look at that and if you're using a measure, an instrument that is not designed to measure the construct or variable of interest then this could potentially introduce some issues with validity of your potential study results. Here are some issues and things you need to think about when considering measurement issues. With classic measurement theory, your observed score is a true score plus or minus measurement error. Measurement error can be either random or system systematic. Random error is expected, but systematic error can in in increase or interfere with the true observed score. There are multiple sources of error when measuring your uh, concepts and your variables. Maybe the subject or data collector fills out the instrument incorrectly. Maybe there's an error in scoring or observing the event that you're monitoring. Maybe you scored the instrument incorrectly. All of these potential sources listed here can increase the potential systematic error and, and potentially bias your results. And what you may find sometimes is uh, when you're analyzing results, 
is that maybe you have more variability in your results. And this is more, this is even more true when you have a small sample size. And what the, and this may equate to maybe larger standard deviations. And it may create errors uh, and difficulties in your analysis. So what I wanted to do now is talk about the difference between a theoretical definition and an operational definition. For example, with depression, a theoretical definition may be the severity and depth of physical and psychological symptoms consistent with clinical depression as defined by the American Psychiatric Association's Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, the fourth edition. And you may operationalize this theoretical definition by using the Beck Depression Inventory, number two. And on this particular scale, it has an effective subscale and a somatic subscale. So in this example, you can see where you have theoretical or conceptual definition, and then you have a operational definition or the proxy on how, in this case, you're going to measure depression and come up with a score that you can in turn analyze and report in your results. Another example may be an adverse event or trauma. And a theoretical definition for this may be an unusual circumstance that causes a physical and or psychological harm to an individual. You may operationalize this as it being a description of the combat related circumstances that led to say, in this case, maybe you're interested in patients with amputations. And you may measure this with different methods or units of measure. Maybe you elicit this information through unstructured interviews in a qualitative study or structured interviews. Maybe you have open-ended questions or you have a, a questionnaire that evaluates this information. Maybe there's a checklist or some sort of scaled instrument. All of these are proxies for how you would operationalize or measure an adverse event or a trauma with this theoretical definition. In your method section, you need to make sure you describe and include copies of your data sheets demonstrating what demographic data you're going to collect. Just about any institutional review board protocol you submit and grant applications are going to require this information. You also need to describe when the data will be collected and it's helpful to many times include a table or a flow sheet that demonstrates when and how you will collect the data. This is also helpful when you actually go to implement the study, and it can be helpful for your research assistants so they can have a quick reference in terms of how the procedures and the study, the procedures for conducting the study and collecting the data. It's important that you provide the rationale for why you're collecting the data. You need to describe the details surrounding the data collection. You also need to link your data collection plan to your specific aims research questions and hypotheses. In this slide, I get, provide you with some examples of how you can potentially code and some things you need to consider when you're collecting demographic data. An important point when you're developing your demographic data collection sheet is to set it up so it's easy to code the data and enter it into a database. This is especially important if you're going to have a research assistant, a student, or somebody else actually enter the data once it's collected. And I've listed here some examples. And later on in this podcast, we'll actually go over a uh, research methodology section and some demographic data collection and instruments that we used in a study. For example, if you're, you have a demographic data collection sheet, you may have male and female gender. You may actually code it as zero or one and making this easier to enter into your database. It's also very important that you include copies of your instruments and demographic data collection sheets in your protocol and grant submission. How will you collect the data? One of the things you need to think about is how it will be collected. Are you going to observe? Are you going to download the data from a database? Are you going to do a chart or electronic medical review? Are you going to be collecting data in person? Or are they going to have them complete a form? Or are you going to have somebody that's going to ask them questions and fill out the questionnaire? If you're doing a survey, are you doing it through the mail, through the internet, a telephone survey? If you're doing a survey in the military, there may be special requirements and instructions that you need to follow 
based on your specific branch of service. A popular way this day to use uh, to conduct surveys is to use a um, service called SurveyMonkey. Now I have no um, proprietary interest in any companies or devices I talk about, but I have seen um, in several studies investigators use this service. You may also have the ability if you're at a military treatment facility that somebody can assist you with development of a survey or if you're at a university you may they may have the ability to help you develop and uh, at least um, put out your survey. Many times you can conduct if you're doing a study with uh, members of your professional association you may need to contact the association to provide ask for permission to sample from membership and in some cases you may need to pay a fee to survey those particular individuals. Additionally in your methods section you need to describe people's roles and their percent effort. This is important for grants because if you're hiring a research assistant the percent effort may equate to an amount of salary. Also you need to think about do you need a consultant such as a statistician who has expertise in a certain type of analysis? Sometimes you need to build that into your grant budget. You also need to describe who will do what. What are the members of the team's responsibilities? This is an especially important if you're applying for a grant because it goes to feasibility issues. Are you having a multidisciplinary team? Have you uh, chosen people to be a member of your research team who have necessary expertise and skills to execute the study? So this is real important when you're asking grant organizations for large sums of money, they want to see that you have the capability to conduct the research. Other things you need to think about is how much money will you need? Do you, you need to go through and have a detailed budget? And if you're submitting a, a, a grant, you're applying for a grant through Tri-Service Nursing Research Program and you're attached to a military treatment facility, you may need to go through the Henry Jackson Foundation or the Geneva Foundation. If you're at a university, you should have a grant agent department at your university or in your department that can assist you with this. You need to think about, if you're doing a smaller study, you need to think about, or even any sort of study, you need to think about what type of equipment and supplies you may need. Do you need space? Do you need computer access? Do you need a computer to conduct the study? As I mentioned, are there personnel you need to hire? And how much time? do you need to conduct the study? And not, we're not going to go into great detail in this information, but it's important that you think about these considerations and seek out those resources that can help you with budget development. Sometimes you, ne you may need to um, elicit people to volunteer and assist if you're on a shoestring budget or if you have no money at all. In many cases you need to beg, borrow, and plead to get your study done. And I can't stress this enough. When you're writing up a research protocol, a, submitting a grant, the details are very important. You need to provide the reviewers with a very clear picture of what exactly you intend to do. You need to leave nothing to their imagination. You need to justify and provide a rationale for your decisions and procedures. You need to identify any limitations, any potential problems, and solutions, how you address that with your protocol. You need to describe quality control procedures, how you're going to potentially clean your data, and as I mentioned, you need to describe any limitations. The key is you need to provide these details so that the reviewer sees, they, when they get done reading this, they think, man, this researcher has thought of everything. But if you leave out details and you, you assume that others understand what you're doing, then you're increasing the chances that you may have difficulties getting your study approved or in many cases it may require multiple revisions to get the study approved and in some cases this may make the difference between you getting that grant and not getting that grant. You need to develop a realistic timeline. You need to map it out. This will let you know if you're meeting your milestones. Also you need to remember some processes take longer than others. For example getting a protocol through the IRB always takes longer than you think. And you can pause this podcast and you can look at this further at this timeline, example of a, of a timeline 
to show you potential steps or milestones that you need to complete and you can almost use this as a template in developing a research study or a grant submission. Now we're going to go over a, an example of how to write up a method section from a previously conducted study here at Naval Medical Center San Diego. And in this study that I'm going to go over in terms of our method section, this was in a copy of the abstract that was published in the American Association of Nurse Anesthetists in August 2011. And the title of this study was Perioperative Administration of Gabapentin for Shoulder Arthroscopy and we conducted a prospective, randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled study. And you can, read, you can pause this podcast and read through this abstract to see what our results were. In subsequent slides, I will go over how we uh, wrote up the method section that got approved through our Institutional Review Board. And this was a actual method section from a study that we completed where we evaluated a we conducted a prospective randomized double blind placebo controlled investigation to determine the efficacy of gabapentin on postoperative pain when administered preoperatively perioperatively to patients undergoing shoulder arthroscopy with general anesthesia and in our scaling blocks so you can see under our first section here that we conducted a prospective randomized double blind contro placebo controlled investigation and we described what our pot potential population was and then we went on to describe that we were going to enroll a convenient sample of 70 male and female subjects who were eligible for care at our facility and listed here are our inclusion and exclusion criteria that we had for this study. These are pretty standard inclusion exclusion criteria. And in this particular study, we were doing an, what's called an interscaling nerve block or a regional anesthetic. And so we needed to make sure that the patients consented to both having general anesthesia and a peripheral nerve block prior to surgery. We excluded patients who had a history of, a, had any contraindication to an interscaling block, if they had a neuropathy in the surgical extremity. And this was important because this could potentially bias our study results. Likewise, if a patient had a history of a chronic pain syndrome, this could also bias the results. Also, an important uh, exclusion criteria we had on this study was that if it was a planned open surgical shoulder procedure, when we initially put this study through the Institution Review Board, an orthopedist on the review board had some concerns with our design. Initially, we were going to enroll all patients having shoulder, arthro shoulder surgery. Whether the sh procedure was done completely arthroscopically or it was a combination of open shoulder procedure with uh, arthroscopy. And so what we did after uh, getting feedback from the Institution Review Board is that we decided not to enroll patients who were scheduled to have an open shoulder procedure so that we can minimize this potential bias. The reason for this is that this could uh, bias or skew the results because some patients may, with open shoulder procedures, may have much more pain after surgery. So I'm going to go through and scroll through uh, more of uh, the method section to give you an idea of how one would be written up. So after we described our inclusion-exclusion criteria, we just described how we were going to randomly assign patients to the two groups and in this case we used a random numbers table and the randomization was conducted by our inpatient pharmacist and then we go on to describe in detail the uh, protocol in terms of when the subjects were going to receive the medications, either placebo or the steady drug, and in this case we were giving gabapentin, and we were giving it on postoperative day one and postoperative day two. And you can see here, when we wrote up the protocol in the methods section, we provided some justification for why we chose this, this uh, dosing strategy. 
and you can see I highlighted here a reference and then we use some justification for why we chose this. You may have a reviewer who has some expertise in this area and they may question why you're doing it. So it's better to provide more details to them. We go on to again describe, you know, our sequence of events, almost the timing of what goes on, you know, that we were going to talk with the patients how we're going to collect the data. How and then for how long? And then the next section talks about how they were randomized. And then you will see here how we describe how we were blinded and we did not know what group they were they were in. However, we went on to address any potential concerns and said that if there were any problems, like an adverse reaction, that uh, one of the investigators would contact the pharmacist to determine what group was, would be administered so that we could submit an adverse drug report or an adverse event report to the Institutional Review Board. And then we go on to describe uh, some more specific procedures in terms of the anesthetic technique in the block in the next few paragraphs in terms of how they're intraoperatively managed and postoperatively managed. Feel free to pause the podcast and read through these uh, paragraphs if you like. And you can see as we're going through here, um, we're in the narrative section, we're describing you know, what data we're collecting at the different time points. We we'll also make reference to our uh, demographic data in our instrument data collection sheets. And then go on. As these patients were discharged, we described, um, you know, how we were going to collect their data from them. And in this case, the patients were given questionnaires and then they were contacted by one of the investigators uh, to follow up and get the information and they were actually provided with an envelope that they could uh, that was already self-addressed and stamped that they could return to us. We also described what demographic data we were collecting and we provided uh, copies of our references in our appendices. In this next section of our protocol we went on to describe our instruments you can think of your instruments, these are the proxies for the concept or variable that you're measuring. In this case, we were using a verbal numeric rating scale. And we went on to describe some, why we, some justification or a description of the instruments and provided some references to support using those, um, using a verbal numeric rating scale to support its reliability and validity. We also use a morphine, what's called a morphine equivalent scale, where we converted all the opioids to a, a standard dose so that it was easier to analyze. And again, we provided a uh, reference that supports that. And with many instruments, you also need to present the reliability and validity data. If there's a, a kappa, result for that potential particular instrument you need to provide details of that or at least a reference depending on uh, what your um, reviewing body or grant agency expects. Again we use the patient satisfaction scale and we describe that instrument and then we also use the sleep we measured sleep quality and quantity and you can see here we described some validity issues with this particular reliability and validity issues with the study after we described um, how the instrument, what the instrument measures and how it's, um, it collects the information. In this case, it uses a Likert scale. And then in, in this case, uh, we presented inf information showing that in this case, polysomnography and su subject subjective sleep measures of sleep length and sleep latency showed high mean inter-individual correlations. And we actually presented the correlations between the, this particular instrument and a polysomnography which is considered the gold standard for measuring sleep and as well as we presented the uh, reliability data and that's the kappa here and sensitivity and specificity data so this is a good example of, of the type of information that you would want to present when 
describing the instruments you're using in your particular study. And then we also provided a data collection uh, table, which actually talked about the different time points uh, of our study in terms of what we were collecting, how we were collecting it, and when we were collecting it. This is a nice table that reviewers can quickly look at to see what you're collecting. And it's also a good reference for your um, data collectors and associate investigators. And they can almost use it as a checklist. And this continues to go on. At our particular inst institution, it also has a category for retroviral research. And in this case, there was it was not applicable. In the next section, of this particular uh, at Naval Medical Center San Diego in the methods section would be a description of any investigational drugs, devices, or biological research. In this particular study we were using gabapentin. Gabapentin was a medication that was initially approved for the treatment of seizure disorders and post herpatic neuralgia. However, it's been used off-label for many years in the treatment of acute and chronic pain in dosages ranging from 300 to 800, 1,800 milligrams a day. And so what we did in this section is we provided information justifying that this is considered a standard of care at our facility and that our dosage was um, associated with minimal side effects based on our experience. and that we um, noted that when we did use it that patients had less post-operative pain and less side effects from opioids such as nausea and vomiting. However, because this drug was not approved by the Federal Food and Drug Administration for the treatment of acute post-operative pain, because we're using it in a, an off-label use in research, we chose our Institutional Review Board required us to get a what's called an investigational dr new drug application and we submitted that and actually our institution submitted that to the FDA. With uh, investigational new drug applications a fairly quick process there's only a couple forms that you need to fill out and your local IRB can help you uh, fill it out and submit the appropriate paperwork. Typically if you don't hear back from the FDA within 30 days then it's safe to continue on with it but it's always important to uh, review any new uh, policies or procedures and to look at the FDA website and their specific instructions for completing the application. The next section in our this particular methodology section was a description of the statistical analysis plan and in this case we worked with one of our um, statisticians in the development of the statistical analysis plan. And you can see it's a fairly standard. We talked about uh, we were using descriptive and inferential statistics and then how we were going to analyze our demographic data. And in this case, we were collecting uh, repeated measures over time. So we're using repeated measures analysis of variance. And then we described how we were going to analyze our primary outcome, and in this case was pain scores. And then we went on in the next paragraph to describe how we chose our sample size. And we based this on a previous study. You can see here number 43. And we used their uh, uh, mean difference that they found with the standard deviation. And then we, and with uh, collaboration with our statistician, we determined what an appropriate effect size would be. In this case, uh, a 16 millimeter difference in pain scores. And we came up with a sample size of 56 subjects, or 28 per group, and we accounted for a 25% attrition rate, which came up with a total of 35 subjects, or a total of 70 per group. It's important when you're developing a clinical research study that you consider um, past experience in enrolling particular uh, populations, and missing data, and just the general fudge factor, and in most circumstances you may have anywhere from a 10 to 30% attrition rate depending on your study design. In some cases, if you're doing survey research, this uh, attrition rate may be even higher. And that needs to be uh, addressed in uh, detail in your statistical analysis section.
In this case, because this was a um, study conducted in a military treatment facility, we uh, provide some uh, military relevance and operational use. And in this case, we talked about how um, many uh, combat veterans may have shoulder injuries and that this may potentially benefit them. And then in the next section uh, was, a, was an application to use human subjects. And a lot of the information in this section is uh, it's repetitive and it's important that you um, provide the information. Many times you can just cut and paste it, but if you leave that information out, many times the Institutional Review Board and reviewers are going to ask you to put that information back in there. And there's some information in here that may not necessarily have been in the other section. You also need to make sure you uh, do multiple checks and have multiple people review your application prior to submission. Check it for any grammatical uh, spelling errors and make sure and check it for content. But you can see here we described our subject population. We again listed our inclusion exclusion criteria. We also talked about protected population. At least it, in this particular uh, protocol um, template, they asked if we're using any um, protected population. Um, and in our circumstance, we were not going to enroll any female patients that were pregnant because these patients usually do not have um, elective surgery. And uh, we were only enrolling adults, so we were not enrolling uh, minors or people less than 18 years of old age. And then we went on to describe uh, our consent process, and you can pause this podcast and read through it. And we talked about how we would identify the patients and how we would obtain consent. In this case, we uh, provided uh, information sheet to the subjects, uh, if possible, prior to surgery. And then we enrolled uh, subjects on the day of surgery. And this was um, fairly standard with most of our research protocols at our institution. But you need to check with your local IRB in terms of what the requirements are. And they may actually uh, not, they may require you to uh, enroll the patients prior to the day of the procedure because this could, in some circumstances, be uh, perceived as coercion. Here we provided justification for why we were doing that, because this was routine with our previous studies, and there was some historical um, support for this. And then we just went on to describe uh, in detail what we were doing. And again, you can read through this. And we provided um, uh, additional information in our appendices. And then we went on to describe the experimental procedure. Now again, this is going to seem a little repetitive, but you need to provide this additional information in there. If you're doing a clinical study where you're collecting information from patients, even though it may not be considered an experiment where you're randomizing patients, it's better to provide this information in this section rather than not. Uh, and if you have any questions, you should seek out a mentor who's got some experience in uh, writing up research protocols. So again, a lot of this information was similar or paraphrased from previous stuff presented in the protocol. And then we went on to list our research material collected, because that's what the protocol requested. And in, uh, in section three or in our appendices, we provided copies of that, and I'll go over those in a minute. And then we went on to describe how we protected patient privacy. In this case, we provided them with a unique uh, subject ID number, so we weren't having any uh, PHI data, and that we locked our uh, information, our data collection sheets were de-identified and stored in a locked file cabinet in a password-protected computer that only the investigators had access to. And we made sure that we had it. We, we kept the master list of our subjects, but we did not, uh, we kept the uh, consents in a separate uh, location because that had uh, protected information in it. And then the next section we went on to describe the risks of the uh, study. And here we talked about the side effects of gabapentin. And if you're using a study drug, many times you can get this from the um, pharmacy pharmacist um, and you can provide that information. In some cases you can provide a reference in your appendices. And we just went on again to provide more details of why we chose to do this and how it was safe and how we were going to minimize the risk. We had a orthopedic surgeon on the study 
And uh, we also talked with one of our chronic pain physicians to assist us with um, any potential issues with the study. And our chronic pain physician had extensive experience with this uh, medication. In this case, we weren't doing any radiation or laser exposure, but if you did have a study that included that, you would need to provide information on that, and you may need to get additional uh, permission. And then we provided some, oh, sorry, we provided some justification of the risks. And this is really important, especially if you're doing a study that may be considered high risk. And in this case, we described that the potential for decreased pain outweighs any potential risks or side effects with the medication. And then we provided justification that um, why we uh, chose to do this study and that we were complying with all of our standards of care and that we would use a medical monitor um, if we had any issues with this particular drug and that we would uh, provide um, adverse reports to the IRB at the appropriate time. And then we went on to describe how we minimize the risks of the study. In this case, we chose to go with a lower dose than previous investigations. And then what we did to minimize the risk and also to provide some information on side effects of the medication, we chose to collect information on sedation and dizziness, were the two most common side effects of this particular drug. And then we, again, went on to provide detailed information on that. So we went on to, because gabapentin's two most common side effects are dizziness and sedation, we decided to collect information on this. Uh, one, because it helps us understand the, the side effects and it demonstrates how we are deciding to minimize the risks and address any concerns. Plus this is an important, I think, clinic from a clinical standpoint. We also provided the, we, uh, provided the IRV with information on, uh, of what we were telling the subjects if they had any problems with the study drug. Also, we chose to exclude patients with a history of obstructive sleep apnea because we were of concerns that uh, over-sedation may create problems with them. In our next few uh, minutes, I'll, go, I'll uh, sh show you our demographic data collection sheet and our instruments we used in this study. Again, you can pause this podcast and uh, look over the data collection sheet. This is just one example of how you would uh, could uh, potentially make a demographic data collection sheet. The important things I would point out is that uh, we don't have any subject identifiers on there. We only give them a u unique subject ID number. And then we went on to describe our demographic data here. And then... Uh, you know, we had some baseline pain scores we were collecting. In this case, we were using a verbal numeric rating scale. And we just had some more information that was specific to, because we were doing the block, we collected information on that. And then we collected information on any medications that were administered, any complications that occurred with the block. And then we had it, we broke it down by uh, preoperative baseline data. And then we had a separate form for intraoperative data collection where we recorded the medications, and this shows the IRB what information we're exactly collecting. And then we had a post-operative data collection sheet. Again, we were listing times and preventing information. Any medications that were administered. Any of our post-anesthesia care unit scores that we were interested in. And then we had a home data collection sheet. This is the uh, form that we gave the patients in the self-addressed staff envelope. And you can see how we measured sleep. And then uh, we asked them to record any medications they had, uh, medications they took, and when they took study drugs. And, and, it's, uh, and it goes on similarly like that. So this is a, a nice example in terms of how you can develop your, your, your instruments, and, uh, sh and it's real important that you include copies of any instruments or questionnaires in demographic data collection sheets in your research protocol.
Thank you. Here are some resources for identifying instruments for clinical research. The first is a book by uh, Frank Stromberg and Olson, and it's a nice book that describes instruments for clinical healthcare research. It has uh, detailed information on various instruments with uh, associated reliability and validity data, and in some cases, how to contact the author of the instrument. Another good resource is the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, the National Quality Measures Clearinghouse, and the link is here that is uh, listed here, and this will take you to a list of their website where you can search through various uh, research and quality measures. Here's some references I used in development of this podcast. And finally, our disclaimer. Thank you.